So we're going to be going through the book of Philippians. And I get to kick us off, um, Philippians 1, 1 through 5. So if you don't have your Bible, just look on the screen. Uh, verse 1, this letter is from Paul and Timothy, slaves of Jesus Christ. I'm writing to all of God's holy people in Philippi who belong to Jesus Christ, including the church leaders and deacons. Verse 2, may God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. Every time I think of you, I give thanks to my God. Whenever I pray, I make, I make my requests for all of you with joy. For you have been my partners in spreading the good news about Christ from the time you first heard it until now. Let's pray. God, I thank you so much for the opportunity to stand up here and speak your word. And I just ask that you would speak through myself, Pastor Joy, and Bruno this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So I would like to speak to you this morning about how to find joy in your jail. Yeah, it's, it's good. It's light. It's, got, it's a light topic. It's good. Um, so when I first began to just kind of dive into these first five verses, I actually was focused on who Paul and Timothy were writing to, what they were writing, the letters, why. And verses two through four just kind of kept coming back to me. And I, I read, or I, I just kept reading, and, and I kept noticing how Paul was pouring out grace, peace, and joy in these letters. And that that kept ringing back to me. How did he have that in, his, in that circumstance for him to be in jail, for him to be in the predicament that he was in, to be able to pour out all of that? I just, it kept ringing back to me. So I actually kind of changed it. I think as leaders, parents, pastors, bosses, if you're in any type of leadership role where you have people following you, that's just normally what you do. You forget about you, and you focus on everyone else. Um, the ship could be sinking, and you're like, it's all good. We're going to be great. It's, don't worry about it. You take on the stress. So you, you, you just carry the stress. Uh, parents, you carry the stress for your kids. You don't let them know really what's going on. And so um, I actually was reminded, um, as a pastoral team, we, we did something about three months ago. And our team came down to San Francisco, and we were getting ready to do a meeting um, for the first time. And one particular pastor had had quite the past 24 hours. Um, if you, it was like his windows were smashed in. There were some things that went on with his house that were pretty big that needed to be fixed. It was like 24 hours of the devil just going, <laughs> I'm just going to make life a little bit tougher for you right now. And we were breaking ground in San Francisco with this meeting. And so, you know, we knew it was an attack. Um, and I honestly was expecting a text message that said, hey, I got a lot going on. Do you mind, you know, the few of you that are already down there, can you go ahead and run the meeting? Would not have been surprised. In fact, I was ready to kind of just say, yeah, absolutely. Do what you got to do. And so, this pastor showed up, and he was all smiles. You would have never known that what happened to him in the past 24 hours had happened. He had joy in his circumstance, joy in his situation. And not only that, not only did he have joy, he spread the joy to everyone in the meeting. Hey, man, how's it going? Man, I'm doing great. How are you? Not, it's been, it's been, a, it's been a tough 24 hours. Had a lot happen. No, there was none of that. And so I actually, I, I sat there and I went, okay, first of all, would I have shown up to the meeting? One. Two, would I have shown up to the meeting with joy if that was my circumstance? And so then I turned it to Paul and I was like, ha would I, would I have the joy that Paul's had? How, how God, how did Paul have this type of joy? And I just heard God say, Paul had faith that I was on, that, that what I had placed in his life was that it was an unshakable faith. And so when I, when I hear that, I go, okay, faith activates that joy. So you have to have faith to activate that joy. So if you have your, your notes in front of you, my first point is to have joy for others, it must come from a place of abundance. We must have faith in abundance if we're not only going to have faith for our joy for ourselves, but joy for others. How, how was Paul so joyful? 
Paul knew that no matter what would what happened, no matter what no matter what was to come, no matter what was already happening to him, that that's what God had called him to do. That circumstance was actually a circumstance that that God was in control over. That's how he had faith in that. Psalm 16:11 says, "You make known to me the path of life." In your presence, there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. So I began to also think of all the things just in the past 20 years that, that Kaylin and I have walked through. And um, in the very beginning of our marriage, first few years, um, it was pretty tight. We didn't have two pennies to rub together. There were many months where we had to decide which bill we were going to pay. Are we going to pay this one this month or are we going to pay this one this month? And, and an exciting night out on the town for us was going to our couch and digging through and seeing if we could find change and going to our car and seeing if some change had dropped there and we were going out to McDonald's and we were gonna order off the dollar menu. And let me tell you, it wasn't McDonald's that brought us joy. But it was a word that God had given us that said, Krista, Kaylin, remain faithful. Keep giving, keep tithing, keep going to church, keep doing what you're doing, keep raising your girls, keep digging in the couch cushions, get to go to McDonald's and have some fun. I'm going to take you out of this circumstance. It doesn't mean it's going to be easy. It doesn't mean it's not going to be tough, but I'm going to give you joy in that circumstance. And then there was a time where we had been here for about a year maybe a year and a half, and uh, we moved from Atlanta, Georgia, ATL, and we, when we got here, about 18 months in, we had three basically like second parents to us. Um, they all passed away um, within 18 months of cancer. Um, that was crushing for us. To, one, to not be able to be there, to not be able to walk through chemo with them or hold their hand or say goodbye or do any of the things that you normally do with a parent or someone that's that close to you, we had to say goodbye 3,000 miles away. That wrecked us. We had to link arms, link arms with God and say, okay, God, where's our joy? This is a circumstance that's way beyond us. I feel paralyzed. What? What's next? And so God poured out he poured out joy in that circumstance that we would not have been able to handle on our own. And then this last one is actually something that I'm walking out right now. Um, I thought I was going to hit it with flying colors and do great. My baby girl graduates this Friday from high school. It is our, our first graduation. And we are at the very beginning stages of kind of empty nesting. And I thought, man, I've been praying this for, for years. I'm, gonna, I'm totally going to nail this one. I'm going to be like, later, do what you got to do. <laughs> I have been a hot mess. You know what I'm saying? Parents, you're like, your teenagers, right? And you're like, yeah, they're going to go to college. Bye. No, everything inside of me has wanted to pull her back. Everything inside, I have been crying. I have been... It's been hard to let go of, of this person that's been in my, my house that I've been raising for 18 years. And so I had to go to God and say, God, I need joy. Because if I don't have joy, I'm just going to crush what she's got, what she's getting ready to walk into. As, you know, again, it's not joy for you. It's joy for other people. And so I've, I think I'm having better days now than before. I'm not, I'm not crying anymore. And I'm actually in a place where I'm excited. I'm excited. She's, she's signed up for college. She's getting ready to, to experience all these things. And the promise that God gave Kaylin and I is you have raised your daughter well. You've done everything that I've asked you to do. You've raised her in the house. Now let her, let her go. She's mine. And I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to guide her. I've got her. And so in that I have found joy, not only for myself and for Kaylin, but for Sky as well. And so I just want to encourage you guys this morning, Psalms 51, sorry, your second note or your the second point in your worship guide is joy does not come from outward circumstances. Joy comes from God. So do you have the faith for your circumstance? 
Do you have the faith that God is going to give you the joy that you need to walk through what you're walking through? Psalms 51, 12, restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. Proverbs 17, 22, a cheerful or joyful heart is good medicine, but a broken spirit saps a person's strength. So this morning, before I invite up Pastor Joy, I want to leave you with two things, two questions. One, do you have the faith that God can give you the joy that you need? And two, do you not only have joy enough for yourself, but joy for others? Rick Warren said, joy is the settled assurance that God is in control of all the details of my life. The quiet confidence that ultimately everything is going to be all right and the determined choice to praise God in every situation. Thank you. Well, good morning, church. I didn't realize that when we were going to do Smiling Saints that my name was going to be all over this series all summer. So my apologies from the get-go. I apologize for that. But I'll try not to giggle every time I read my own name when I read the scriptures. But as we go on in this passage, why don't you uh, look on the screen and read the next few verses with me. This is Philippians chapter 1, verses five, uh, 6 through 8. This is what Paul says. I pray with great faith for you because I am fully convinced that the one who began this glorious work in you will faithfully continue the process of maturing you and will put his finishing touches to it until the unveiling of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's no wonder I pray with such confidence since you have a permanent place in my heart. You have remained partners with me in the wonderful grace of God, even though I'm here in chains for standing up for the truth of the gospel. Only God knows how much I dearly love you with the tender affection of Jesus, the anointed one. Uh, we're going to spend primarily um, most of the time on that first verse, uh, verse 6. But I do love how Paul is so personal in his message to the Philippians. And now that I'm getting older, it's funny. When, when I first came to experience church, um, it's it over three years ago, actually. I, it was actually at a worship team rehearsal. And I remember seeing some of these worship team members. And I was just struck with, like, love. And I didn't know where it was coming from. I realized, and I, I literally, I don't know if anyone was there. I, I literally started crying. I was like, oh, surprise, right? Someone's like, surprise, joy cries. <laughs> I, I had a good cry down here this morning, worshiping as the team led. I was so thankful for their, their strength and their leadership. But I really was overwhelmed. I, I think the Lord was really developing in me the heart of a father and not just a participant, not just um, someone else who's here to consume or to take. Um, and so the Lord was really telling me, I think you need to really become a father of this house so that you can bless others and not just be concerned about getting blessing for myself. So I'm really thankful to talk to you this morning. And you actually met my wife earlier in the, in the worship experience. She's the one who welcomed you, Kim. If you don't know, I'm I really did marry up. A lot of people say this. They marry like, you know, I married someone much smaller than me. I literally married up. She's like, <laughs> she's like three inches taller than me. And, and this, is, this is just the honest truth. Um, there's actually a picture of us on our wedding day, I think, in there somewhere. <laughs> what, what you don't know is she's wearing ballet flats and crouching. I'm wearing Doc Martens and I'm on my tiptoes in that picture. That is, that is 24 years ago this September. So I am so thankful for this woman. And <laughs> it's funny because a lot of people, it, it, when we're in the Philippines, we've only been there one time, Kim and I were there. People were like, oh, my gosh. Like, there's no couth with Filipinos. It's like, they're like pointing, you know. And I was like, oh, oh yeah, yeah. She's, she's my... <laughs> She's my wife, yeah. I, didn't, I never thought of it, right? And so some people are like, man, bro, you're, you got, you're just brave, man. How, how would you ever ask her out? Well, here's the truth. I was not the initiator. <laughs> I, I'm just saying, okay, so it's not because, you know, she's, I'm just a coward. Okay, let's be honest. I was like, I never really dated a girl taller than me. And I was like, I, I, I can't do it. We would talk all the time. She's just amazing. She's, she's as beautiful inside as she is on the outside, right? She's a visionary. She's a dreamer. She's, she has strength. She gives people hope. She's truly a mom of this house. And even back then, I could see that strength in her. I was like, I don't know. I'm, I think I'll just, we really have chemistry, but I'm just, I'll just let it go. But she asked me out on a date, and I was like, 
Okay. And you know what she did? She cooked me dinner. Oh. If anyone knows me, you know my first love language is food, right? So I even remember what we had. We had chicken and this chicken dish with noodles. She even had like, you know, like a chocolate brownie and stuff for, for dessert. We, ate, we were actually in Chicago. We should take that picture off, man. That's, that's many pounds ago. That's, I got I gotta take that off. So speaking of food, I don't want that old picture up there. So we were actually by the Chicago River. We went to Bible school there. She put a little picnic lunch together. She cooked us dinner. We ate right by the, the Chicago Tribune building, which is right by the Chicago River. Anyone who's been in Chicago knows this building. It's just gorgeous. And I knew I'm gonna marry this woman. <laughs> this is like our first date, right? Three months into knowing each other. Uh, yeah, not so much for her. Yeah, <laughs> not the same. But I'm so glad that she was the initiator, right? She, it was really her who decided, you know, I'm gonna kickstart this relationship. And I'm so glad that even in our spiritual journey, we're really not the initiators. I know that in the notes, we actually, I just realized, I think we mixed up our Green Valley location notes with our San Francisco notes. So don't be, don't be confused by the, the notes there, but if you still wanna write stuff down in your margins, uh, the first point I'd love for you to write down is that our Heavenly Father is the initiator. When you read the verse here and it says, um, I, pray with, I pray with great faith for you because I'm fully convinced that the one who began this glorious work in you, and he goes on to finish. If you read that verse, verse six, you notice there's one person who's not present in that verse, me. We are not present in this verse. God is the only one who is present in this whole verse. He is the initiator, even our choice to respond to his invitation, right? We, we prayed, maybe some of us, like I did when I was young, I prayed a prayer of repentance. I'm sorry for my sin, God. I want you in my life. Even that prayer wasn't really initiated by me. It was a response to God's work and invitation in my life. So God is the initiator, right? So it's almost like, well, God, you started it. You got to finish it. It's not on me, right? So... I'm, I'm so glad for that. That gives me peace. Let, let me ask you this. How many, uh, how many Warriors fans are here? Oh, okay. Let me ask you this. How many SF Giants fans are here? Oh, oh okay. Okay, last time I asked it was like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's been a hard couple of years, right? It's been a hard couple of years. Well, I'll be honest with you. I, I am not from the Bay Area, although a lot of Filipinos assume like, oh, he's Filipino. He must be. I'm actually from the New York area. I'm from the East Bay of the New York area, a, a, AKA New Jersey. Okay, I just say outside New York City because people are like, oh, that's much cooler, much, much cooler than New Jersey. But I grew up a Yankee fan. And so I, as long as I wear a Yankee hat, people are like, they give me that weird look. You're wearing the wrong hat, bro. This is not New York City. But I grew up idolizing a lot of Yankee players. And actually, one guy I want to tell you about, his name is Mariano Rivera. There's actually a picture of him as well, if you haven't seen him. He actually goes by the name Mo. Okay, does anyone know who Mariano Rivera? Probably not. Some people do. If you're a baseball aficionado, you do. This man, this year, 2019, was the first baseball player ever inducted to the uh, Major League Baseball Hall of Fame unanimously. That's why it says it. Can you imagine all of the talented people, all the home run hitters, all of the, all of the skilled players, shortstops, you know, third basemen, outfielders, all of those great pitchers, why was this man the only, he's the first and only as of this point, unanimously voted Major League Baseball player into the Hall of Fame? Why? Because he's a closer. He finishes. Why? Why? What's the big deal? Why is he? Because it's so hard to finish. Isn't it? It's so hard to finish. And guess what? Again, in this verse, we're not the finishers. It says here in, in verse 6, I'm fully convinced that the one who began this glorious work in you will faithfully continue the process of maturing you. Again, we are not present. It is the Holy Spirit. And this is the next thing if you're taking notes. The Holy Spirit is the faithful finisher. Yeah, that's right. The Holy Spirit is the faithful finisher. We don't even have to, we didn't have to initiate. We don't have to finish. We just got to follow. I'm so glad. I'm like, God, I don't think I could be Mariano Rivera in my spiritual life. I couldn't finish. I couldn't close every time. But God, I'm so thankful that you are the faithful finisher. The, the last point, if you're taking notes, one more thing I'd like to tell you is Jesus will be the one glorified by your completed and perfect life. At the very end, he says, 
the one who began this glorious work in you will faithfully continue the process of maturing you and will put his finishing touches to it until the unveiling of our Lord Jesus Christ. This Theologians know this. This is actually the day where Christ is going to return. He's actually going to come back, and he's actually not going to say only, here I am, I'm the king of all. He's going to say, I'm taking all these people with me. This is the rapture, right? So at that time, he's going to say, all of their work, all of their spiritual journeys are done. They are perfect and complete. I'm taking them with me, right? So even in this point, he is the one who is going to be glorified. God will get his glory, right? God will get his glory. If we were to see glory, right? Like Lucifer in heaven, when he was the worship leader of heaven and he wanted the attention, it's wrong. But God is perfect. He is holy. There's no one like him. So he has the right to, to deserve, to earn, to not earn, to pursue his glory in us. So he will show himself to be God. Let me leave this one last quote with you. I love this. This is by a pastor named Albert Barnes. It says, God abandons nothing that he undertakes. There are no unfinished words or systems, worlds or systems, no half-made and forsaken works of his hands. There is no evidence in his works of creation of change of plans or of having forsaken what he began from disgust or disappointment or lack of power to complete them. Why should there be in the salvation of the soul? God has got this. So I don't know where you are in your spiritual journey, but when I was in junior high, I'll be honest with you, okay? I prayed that salvation prayer more than once. Has anyone ever done that before? I was like, God, in case it didn't stick. I'm going to do it again, right? But thank God, it's not on us. If you ever see that, that verse again, first Philipp, um, Philippians 1 verse 6, we are not even present in this declaration. It's all about God. So thank you again for letting me share just a little bit of scriptures with you. I am so excited to introduce one of our top leaders. I, he is so good. He loves all my kids. This is Bruno Fritas. Give him a round. What up, what up? What a great message by Pastor Joy and Pastor Krista. You guys killed it. Wow. Wow. You guys are my favorites. <laughs> Anyways, my name is Bruno. For those that don't know me, I get to lead with my beautiful wife in this church. Where we are, we're not 20 plus. We're not 19. We're nine years, two days, and a couple hours now. Our anniversary, our night anniversary was last Friday. So... Yeah, she's the one. <laughs> anyway, so today I'm going to be talking about love. Any lovers in the house? <laughs> eh, I try, right? So for those that don't know, I'm from Brazil. Where are my Brazilians at? They're usually right here. There you go. So pay a lot of attention because I don't have no accent at all, okay? <laughs> All right, let me tell a little bit about my crazy love story. So this goes back to high school where I met this one right here. She was 16, I was 17. And uh, you know, uh, last Friday we just find out that I actually proposed to her on her junior prom, not her senior prom. And her mom was right there too. I can see her mom was like, yeah, I mean, if I say no, you're gonna marry her anyways, right? <laughs> So, a year passed by at her senior prom. She was supposed to go, we were supposed to go to the prom. We actually ended up going to the city hall over here in San Francisco and got married. So, nine years and two days, right? So, five years passed by after we got married. Uh, God decided to gift us with this amazing, beautiful gift that he can ever gave it to us with our baby Isaac. Oh, yeah. So, during, um, during the pregnancy, we didn't know what we're going to be facing. But God knew since the beginning that it was a season that we needed to go through. Right? So, my wife got pregnant. She was, uh, for those that don't know, she was in bed rest for six months. And during that, that period, it was a season of seeking God more. A season where I was trying to see, God, why are we going through this? 
And just seeing my wife the way she was, you know, um, a lot of health complications. She went to the ER multiple times, over 20 times to the ER. And uh, one of her health complications were, it was her kidney. One of her kidneys stopped working. And because of that reason, she had, she had it to go under surgery to place a stent to help her kidney drain, right? And then after that happened, a few weeks passed by, uh, the C-section was already scheduled because she couldn't really do a, a, a regular birth. And she go under C-section. Isaac was born, healthy baby for the glory of the Lord. Very handsome boy. <laughs> Just like my wife, and he was amazing, right? It was amazing. And a few days passed by, we needed to go back to the hospital so she could remove her stent, right? <laughs> and then on the way to the hospital, I was the one driving, and I started feeling this crazy pain on my lower back, excruciating, the, the worst pain I ever had in my whole life. It was so severe that I need to pull over from the freeway, call 911, so they, they came and picked me up. So Ty kept going to the hospital, and I went to the ER at the same building. <laughs> Ty gets there, she goes to see the doctor, they remove the stent, and they check her kid, and guess what happened? She had no stones, no stones at all. During the pregnancy, the doctors would have, they end up doing an ultrasound, and they saw a bunch of shadows of stones. And that, that, was, that was one of the reasons why her kidney stopped working. And I was right there at the ER, right below, one floor below, feeling this crazy pain. The doctor put me through a CT scan. Guess what happened? The moment I prayed to God, I remember this prayer. I said, God, I love my wife so much. She's the one. I don't want to. I don't want to see her suffering like this. One day I got home, she was just bones and skin laying on bed, six months on bed. Some of the family helped us, and and I just tried crying out to God and pray, God, take her pain. You can put it on me. I don't care. <laughs> Take that pain, put it on me, God. I don't care. And that's when I realized that God really hears my prayers. So what y'all, what do you pray for, okay? All right. Uh, the verse I'm going to be reading today. I'm just going to leave out there, you know. The verse I'm going to be reading today, it is in Philippians 1, 9 through 11. This is Paul praying, right? It says, I pray that your love will overflow more and more, and that you will keep on growing in knowledge and understanding. For I want you to understand what really matters, so that you may live a pure and blameless life into the day of Christ's return. May you always be filled with the fruit of salvation and the righteousness character produced in life by Jesus Christ. For this will bring much glory. Praise God. Amen. This is just a, such a powerful verse because what Paul is saying here, what I like about Paul in this one, he's not, he's actually not asking uh, uh, for the, he's not praying for the church uh, to receive love. Right? He says, I pray that you he says, God, love, sorry, <laughs> sorry, sorry. I pray that your love will overflow. He's not saying, okay, give love to the church. No, I pray for your love to overflow, yeah. right? And when he's saying love overflow, and then I start thinking and remembering a Bible verse that I, you know, I read growing up. And one of them, it was 1 Corinthians 13, 13. They don't need to put up there. It says, this three remains, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest is love. So the next verse Paul says on, on, Philipp, on uh, Philippians 1, 9, this is verse 10 now, so you can understand what really matters. What do you think it really matters over here for Paul right now? What really matters is love. You know why? Because when you love, it produces fruits. 
right? It produced peace. It produced kindness. It produced joy. Yeah. It produced everything that we need in life. Yeah. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. And as I was reading the Bible this week, I started crying out to God again and say, God, this time I'm just thanking you. I'm just thanking you for everything you've done for us. And also, when love overflows, it gives the ability to impact. It gives the ability to impact your work zone, your school, your community, your church, globally, everywhere you go. Right? So, right now, <laughs> I would like to show you guys uh, something that what I'm trying to explain it to you, okay? I'm just trying to say it's not, it's not bad for you to experience God's love for yourself. It's not bad. But when, when you overflow, whenever you experience that love, for yourself, you just skip it right there. That's only you, right? What about people that you know? <laughs> Why are you keeping it for yourself? Yeah. You should do what? You should overflow. This is the love that God is talking about because when you overflow, you're able to reach nations. You're able to reach more schools. You're, reach, you're able to reach your family members, people that have been praying for a very long time. You're able to reach communities. You're able to reach everyone. But it needs to start from you. When that love that God is talking about in the Bible overflows over your life, it becomes contagious. Yes. Amen? Amen? And today, I would like to pray for you guys, for our church, and that this love may keep growing, you know? That this love may keep going and, and, into your families, into the neighborhood you live in, into your work zone. Let's pray. God, I pray that not only you experience, I pray that the church that only, only experience God's love, but I pray that your love overflow. I pray that you give a true understanding to our church about what really matters. I pray that your love will just keep overflowing. I pray, God, that your love will overflow so much that we're going to be reaching nations through our love. Yeah. We got to love each other. I pray that for those that have someone that they, they have something against them, just let the love cure that. Let the love come in, the love from God. Let the love, that, the amazing love, just come and take care of all of it. I pray, God, that one day your love will be so much that everyone in the world will know who you are. Yeah. That everyone we know, because when that happened, we, we know you're coming back, God. Yes. We know you're coming back. So, Jesus, come in this place, come in our church, come in our community, come in San Francisco, the Bay Area, with your love. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Fantastic. Man, weren't those guys good today, huh? So good. So encouraged. I love to hear from growing, developing communicators and uh, at experience, we're building a family, we're making a home. And so that means we believe in raising up sons and daughters to become moms and dads. We want to give people opportunities to grow. And how many grew today just by listening to what God was speaking from the scriptures to some great people? And uh, <clears throat> really encouraged. I will say this, I love you, but I will never pray for your kidney stones. That, that, that won't happen. I love you, but we'll never pray for you like that. Uh, but I am glad to know that Bruno is healthy and whole now, and as is Ty, as is Isaac as well. Amen. Uh, <clears throat> thank you for that prayer as well, Bruno. Uh, in the back, we have a little uh, booth back there, table, and it says, Jesus, starting a life-giving relationship with Jesus. And uh, we believe everybody is on a spiritual journey. Some of us are aware of it, some of us aren't. Where we start on that journey is this place of exploring. Is God real? And what, it, what, what does the Bible say? Is, it, is that even true? And how does it pertain to my life, right? If you find yourself kind of in that, that stage of wondering and questioning and, and seeking, we 
have a place for you called Alpha. We'd love for you to be a part of that where we share a meal together and we actually have a discussion where everybody's opinions and beliefs are respected and heard. Uh, we'll be doing that again in this fall. But today, maybe you're here today and you wanna put your faith in Jesus. You heard from the scriptures today. You're like, man, I, I wanna follow Jesus. Uh, we're gonna have some team back there after church. would love to meet you and connect with you and answer any questions you may have. We are prepared and ready to put a Bible in your hands and be there for you in any way that we can.